Okay, we're getting very close to the end of Philippians. Our passage this morning is verses 15 through 19 of chapter 4. We'll have one more message in Philippians next week, and then I'll let you know where we're going to go from there. If we'll go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Um, just to review a little bit about what we covered last week. Remember that when Epaphroditus arrived with this gift from the Philippians, it gave Paul great joy. It was a tangible demonstration of the Philippians' love and concern for him. He was content in his circumstances already, and in fact, he had learned to be content in any and every circumstance. He learned that kind of contentment over the course of his life as a believer. He had been in a lot of difficult circumstances, and he had been in good circumstances as well, and he had learned the secret to, to as he puts it, having abundance and suffering need was to be content. He could endure any and every circumstance because of Christ as the one who strengthened him. We also looked last week at some principles that we can use to be content in our own lives as believers. God wants us to be content. He doesn't want us to base our contentment on our material circumstances, whether they be uh, rich or, or poor. We must recognize that contentment in every circumstance is something that we learn over the course of our lives, that God puts us in circumstances to teach us that. And he orchestrates those circumstances in our lives to teach us contentment and to conform us to the image of Christ. Now at the end of our passage last week, Paul began to express his, his appreciation for this gift that the Philippians had given him. Not just, he's going to continue to do that in verses 15 to 19 this week, but not just for the gift that came at that time through Epaphroditus, but really for the way that the Philippians had supported Paul's work all through his ministry. Let's start in verse 14, and we'll read through verse 19. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction, and you yourselves also know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel, after I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I've received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We'll divide our passage this morning into four parts. The Philippians past support, verses 15 and 16, the profitability of their giving in verse 17, Paul's appreciation and characterization of their gift in verse 18, and Paul's reminder of the supplier in verse 19. Let's look first at the Philippians' past support. <clears throat> Remember last week, Paul wanted to be very clear that even though he was content before the gift arrived, he commended the Philippians for their ministry to him, both through Epaphroditus, who was one of their own, who was sent to Paul to minister to him while he was under house arrest, and for the material gift that the Philippians had brought to him. And as Paul considers that, it causes him to think about all the pastimes that the Philippians had supported him. Of course, the Philippians were themselves very much aware of these occasions, but Paul brings them up in order to express his deep appreciation for them. They had demonstrated their love very recently for him through Epaphroditus and his gift. Now he's demonstrating his love and appreciation for them by recalling their past times of support. He says in verse 15, You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. Now this phrase that he says, the first preaching of the gospel, it's a little bit of a puzzle. He did not come to the region of Macedonia until his second missionary journey, and that was after he had already preached the gospel and established churches in cities like Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Pisidian Antioch on his first journey. In fact, before he got to Macedonia for the first time, he'd already gone through those cities a second time. I know we've shown this map before, but I think it'll be helpful here to understand this passage to look at it again. This is Paul's second missionary journey, he starts out from his sending church in Antioch, and the first thing he does is make his way back through those cities where he'd established churches on his first journey. And this was Paul's habit. He would 
Go to a city either for the first time to proclaim Christ where he had not been proclaimed before, but he would also always follow up in the cities where he had already been to make sure they were doing well, to teach them further about Christ. And that's what he's doing on the first part of this second journey. You remember from Pisidian Antioch, he had thought about going up into Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit had prevented him. He ended up in Troas. And it was there that he received a vision from a man over in Macedonia, the province of Macedonia, saying, come over and help us. So that's what he did. Uh, he crossed the, the sea through the island of Samothrace. He came into the port city of Neop Neopolis, and then he came to Philippi. We talked about the fact that there wasn't a synagogue there. That was his normal habit, was to go to those uh, synagogues in the cities where he visited because those would be the people that were familiar with the Old Testament, and those would really be the people that should have been in the best position to hear the gospel and receive Christ. But he did go down by the riverside where there was a group of women there praying, and he proclaimed Christ to them. You recall that after he left Philippi, his next stop was Thessalonica. There was a synagogue there, and Acts 17 tells us that for three Sabbaths, Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. He is the one prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. Some believed, to be sure, but there was also strong Jewish opposition, as there was in most of the places that Paul preached. Remember, he had to leave Thessalonica, and he went from there to the next town, Berea. He proclaimed the gospel there. Some of them believed as well. Paul says that they, or the book of Acts tells us that they were more noble the Bereans were, and they searched the scriptures themselves to see if these things were so. But the opposition from the city of Thessalonica, the Jewish opposition, was so strong that they pursued Paul over into Berea and stirred up the crowds against him there. So from there, he went down to the city of Athens, and he gave instructions to Silas and Timothy, who were with him, to rejoin him there as soon as they could. It was at this point, when he headed down to Athens, that he left the province of Macedonia. These cities of Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea were all part of the Roman province of Macedonia. But once he went to Athens, he was in the province of Achaia. If you look closely, you can see that up on the map. <clears throat> he preached on Mars Hill in Athens. Then he subsequently made his way over to Corinth, which is also in the province of Achaia. And it was while he was there that he received a gift from the Philippians. Acts 18 tells us about this. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, so they're rejoining Paul in Corinth, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. The implication was that while he was there initially, he had to work. He had to make tents with Priscilla and Aquila in order to support himself. But once they brought their gift down from Macedonia, Paul was able to be freed up and completely devote himself to a ministry of the word. Now, Paul also talks about this in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, When I was present with you, that is in Corinth, and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need, and in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you, and will continue to do so. So I think this is what Paul's talking about in Philippians 4.15, is when he says, After I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving you, but you alone, this is that part of his journey that he's talking about. Now, this says a lot about the Philippian church. Keep in mind that they themselves are virtually brand new believers. And yet, right away, they see the importance of Paul's ministry. They see the importance of helping him with the, his needs. And they're giving of their finances sacrificially in order to continue the advance of the gospel. It's not just something where they like Paul and they want to see him do well. They want the gospel to continue to advance. They understand that very early on in their lives as, as believers. 
Now, Paul goes on to say that they did even more than that. They did more than just give him a gift uh, after he left Macedonia. He says in verse 16, even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Now, think about that in respect, with respect to what we just said. After he left Philippi, the next city he came to was Thessalonica. He just barely gotten out of Philippi good, and they were already sending things to him to support him. Now, Paul was very careful to separate himself from those who were preaching in order to get money from people. There was a lot of that that went on in Paul's day. There were a lot of itinerant preachers of all different stripes, and largely what they were trying to do was fleece people. We see that still happening even today. Uh, and Paul makes it clear that that's not, not something that he was guilty of. He was accused of that. Even in Thessalonica, after he left, uh, people were saying, look, he didn't even stick around. Once there was any kind of trouble at all, he left town. He was just here to try to get your money. Well, he uh, disputes that in his letters to the Thessalonians on two different occasions. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5, he says, We never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. And then down in verse 9, it says, For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Now, that doesn't mean that he was working around the clock 24-7, but there were night, night, a night, kind of time and a day kind of time where he had to work to support himself. That's what he's talking about. Again in the second Thessalonians he says for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we might not be a burden to any of you not because we did not have the right to this but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you, that you might follow our example. Paul didn't think it was wrong to be supported uh, in his work for the gospel. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 9 that the Lord directed those who proclaimed the gospel to get their living from the gospel. But he was willing to give up that right so as not to be thought of as a religious huckster, so as not to be a burden to anybody. And so as to offer himself as a model for working to provide for his own needs. And I think the Philippians must have heard about the fact that as he went over to Thessalonica, he was having to work to provide for himself. And so they gave him a gift so he could be freed up to devote himself again to the ministry of the word and just to get more rest at night. Now, as Paul recalls these earlier gifts from the Philippians, along with the one they have just sent, it's not primarily the gifts themselves that he most appreciates. I'm sure they were helpful to him. He's now arriving in a situation under house arrest in Rome where he can't work and provide for his own needs. It's not a horrible situation. He's not in a dungeon. He has his own rented quarters and he's allowed guests. But still, uh, it would be nice to have more than just what the Roman, Roman government was providing for him. And this gift itself and the abundance it created for him was, was something I'm sure he appreciated. But it was more than, than the gift. And that brings us to our second point, verse 17, the profitability of their giving. He says in verse 17, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit, which increases to your account. Now I put profitability in quotes here because we normally think of that as a financial term. It's how we can make something and sell it for more than what we have in it and make money off of it. Or we make an investment in something like the stock market or real estate and over time our, the amount of our money increases. That's the way we normally use the term profit. And the truth is that throughout this passage, Paul is using financial language. When he talks about giving and receiving in verse 15, he's using a phrase there that was normally used in commerce. And in verse 18, when he says he has received everything in full, that's like a receipt. It's like he's acknowledging the gift that he's received and sending the receipt back by way of Paphroditus. He's also using the language of commerce when he says, I seek for the profit, 
and it increases to your account. But he's not, not talking about monetary profit there. He's speaking instead of the profit of spiritual growth, of the manifestation of God's grace in their lives, as they demonstrated by their willingness to give of their money and to sacrifice to meet the needs of the Lord's servant. It was this kind of spiritual fruit that really delighted the Apostle Paul more than anything. It was the central aim of his ministry to see spiritual growth and maturity in, in the lives of those to whom he ministered. The Philippians' gift to him was an investment that would reap eternal dividends as others came to know Christ through Paul's ministry. And that's a, a principle that's very much relevant for us today. We give to support God's work. We give to support his work locally, to support the building up of the saints in the local church. We also give to support the work of God abroad and making disciples and taking the gospel to all the nations. I think it's important for us to keep that in mind and be faithful in that part of our walk with Christ. Let's look now at Paul's appreciation and characterization of their gift. In verse 18, Paul returns to the thought of their gift and his appreciation for it. In the first part of the verse, he says, I've received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. Now, we noted earlier that he received everything in full is the language of commerce. It's a receipt that the Philippians had, uh, that he had received what the Philippians had sent. And now he had more than he needed. But in the last part of verse 18, he turns from viewing their gift from his perspective to viewing it from God's perspective. He describes it as a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice well pleasing to God. Of course, that's the language of the Old Testament. It's the language of the Old Testament sacrificial system. Even as far back as Noah, uh, we see these same kind of phrases showing up. You remember after the flood waters subsided, Noah and his family and all the animals came off the ark, and Noah offered sacrifices to the Lord as a means of worship. Genesis 8.20 says, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. We also see this language of sacrifice and the Lord's response to it in the book of Leviticus. That's the book that spells out the kinds of sacrifices that were to be offered in each case and, and how they were, be, they were to be prepared. <clears throat> Leviticus 1.9 says, The priest shall offer up in smoke all of it, all of the sacrifice, on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. So this idea of the Lord taking pleasure in the sacrifices of his people, the, the soothing aroma and the acceptable sacrifice were a way of saying that these sacrifices were offered the way God spelled out that they were to be offered. They were offered from obedient hearts and they were pleasing to the Lord because of that. Paul's using that same phrase to describe the gift that the Philippians had sent to him because God was well pleased with it. It was of the highest quality. And even though, strictly speaking, it was a gift to Paul, it was also a gift to the Lord. That which was done for the servant was also done for the master. And Jesus himself talked about this as he was speaking to the twelve when he was getting ready to send them out to minister. In Matthew 10, he says, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. That would be the Father. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. So I think that's in Paul's mind as he commends the Philippians for their gift, not only to him, but also to God. We see also a connection there with Romans 12. Romans 12, 1, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves, to present your bodies, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Paul is describing there the dedication of our bodies 
as a sacrifice to God, a presentation of our bodies to do what the Lord wants us to do, to be obedient to His commandments. That's a spiritual exercise. And in the same way, this giving to the Lord's servant to further the Lord's work was a spiritual sacrifice and exercise as well. Finally, in verse 19, we see Paul's reminder of the supplier. It's already noted that the Philippians' gift to him came at a cost to themselves and was an acceptable sacrifice to God. And he elaborates on their willingness to give even beyond their means concerning another offering in a different place. In 2 Corinthians 8, remember Paul is gathering the offering that will go back to the saints in Jerusalem who were suffering because of their being willing to embrace Christ. And Paul uses the example of the churches in Macedonia, of which Philippi would have been one, to motivate the Corinthians. Uh, Paul was not above this. He would use a church that was doing well to motivate a church that needed a little more encouragement. That's what he's doing here. He says in 2 Corinthians 8, <clears throat> Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, then in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much entreaty for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. That's the kind of attitude that you want in Christian believers. Somebody that sees the importance of the work and wants to give. That's the way the Philippians were. In turn, Paul's providing the assurance that God accepts their sacrificial giving and responds accordingly. He says, my God shall supply all your needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The Philippians have provided for Paul's needs. God will provide for theirs. And this concept of God repaying the giver according to the generosity of of the one who is giving, we see elsewhere in Scripture. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs 19.17 He who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. And then back to 2 Corinthians, where again Paul continues to, to teach the Corinthians and us about how we should give, the attitude with which we should give. He says this in 2 Corinthians 9. Now this I say, he who, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Well, if you think about it, the storehouse from which God repays our giving is limitless. We've already read this morning about how the Lord owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Psalm 24, one says the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. So it's nothing for God to be able to replenish what we give to his work. And he promises to do that. Here in Philippians 4.19, Paul says that these riches are in Christ. That is, that is the means by which they're unlocked. They're available to us who know Christ and who are in union with, the, with him. And certainly our physical needs are met here, but I think Paul is extending beyond just physical needs being met. He's also talking about our spiritual needs. In essence, what he's saying to the Philippians is this. Out of your concern for me as the Lord's servant and with a desire to advance the gospel, you sacrificed and gave to meet my personal and physical needs. In return, God will not only meet all of your physical needs, but he'll also meet all of your spiritual needs as well. So we too like the Philippians, can give freely. God wants us to give freely. He wants us to give joyfully, not under compulsion, knowing that he's going to use our gifts to advance the work of the gospel, to make disciples, and to spread the gospel all, all over the globe. We can give knowing that he's always going to uh, 
replenish what we need and to supply all of our needs in Christ. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for these great promises to us. We thank you that you are a loving Father who knows what we need even before we ask and that you've set it up so that we're stewards of uh, the money that you've entrusted to us, the ability that you've given us to work and to earn. We recognize that part of our responsibility as believers is to give. And we give with joy. We give with joy because we know that you are the source of every good gift. Uh, we give with confidence knowing that you will replenish what we need. And we give motivated to, to have the gospel spread across the world to be able to make disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. We thank you that Paul teaches us that uh, through our passage this morning, and we pray that you would help us to, to put that into practice in our own lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat>